Welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies, offered by the University of the South Pacific. My name is Frank Thomas, Senior Lecturer in Pacific Studies at the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture, and Pacific Studies. I am the presenter for this session, focusing on diaspora and identity. At the end of the session, you will be able to examine the changing patterns of mobility and migration in the Pacific, from ancient to modern times. Reflect on the economic, social, and cultural impacts of migration within and beyond the Pacific region, and assess the impact of contemporary migrations on Pacific identity. The settlement of the Pacific may be divided into two broad phases. One, a Pleistocene, the world's most recent period of repeated glaciations from about 1.8 million to 10,000 years ago of Sahul land, that is greater Australia, including Tasmania and New Guinea, and islands of near Oceania, the Bismarcks to the Solomon Archipelagos, and two, a mid-Holocene, about 3,000 years ago, colonization past the main Solomon Islands into remote Oceania. As the glaciers retreated worldwide and sea levels rose at the end of the Pleistocene, important cultural transformations were underway. One of the most important changes involved the first attempts at plant domestication, which would later have such tremendous impact on human demography and social evolution. By the early Holocene, New Guinea and most, if not all, the islands of near Oceania displayed rich cultural, linguistic, and human biological diversity. Suddenly, within a few centuries, a well-marked cultural horizon appeared from the Bismarcks to Samoa. On present evidence, this Lapita horizon was the first to have reached the islands of remote Oceania. Because of the absence of pre-Lapita occupation in remote Oceania, it has been suggested that further expansion into the Eastern Pacific required considerable improvement in navigational skills and technology not available to Pleistocene and early Holocene seafarers. Lapita may be looked at in terms of continuities and discontinuities in relation to the preceding Pleistocene, early Holocene period. A case for continuity is apparent in the exchange system in place for at least 20,000 years, consisting primarily of obsidian, volcanic glass, and a trend towards increasing exploitation of marine resources since the early Holocene. Also, a regional interactive model and mutual transformations of practice before, during, and after the appearance of Lapita have been proposed for understanding the development of horticulture, small-scale agriculture, and arboriculture, the cultivation of trees, in New Guinea and adjacent islands, which later spread to other parts of the Pacific region. Cultural discontinuity is manifest by the sudden appearance of elaborately decorated pottery, as discussed in Module 2 in the Bismarcks about 3,000 years ago, and its almost instantaneous spread in archaeological terms of Lapita as far east as Samoa within a span of a few generations. Other elements associated with Lapita include a distinctive toolkit and shell ornaments, animal husbandry of pig, dog, and chicken, a new settlement pattern of still houses over lagoons or on the small offshore islands, identified by the telltale signs of post holes, as seen above to the right, and the expansion of trade in obsidian covering a much wider area. Evidence from linguistics and human genetics also provides support for new populations entering the Southwest Pacific. The rapid spread of Lapida from the Bismarcks to the Fiji, Tonga, Samoa area is in marked contrast to the colonization history of the rest of Polynesia and Eastern Micronesia. The so-called long pause, conservatively estimated at 2,000 years, but perhaps longer, along the western margins of Polynesia has intrigued archaeologists. 
One argument that has been put forth relates to the increasing difficulty of sailing against the prevailing southeast trade winds until El Nino events became more frequent of more frequent intensity. Continued expansion towards the extremities of the Polynesian Triangle brought people to islands lying outside the tropics, for example, Easter Island and New Zealand. The cooler climate of those regions, the great distances separating the various archipelagos, and the attendant reduction in the frequency of contacts, together with the challenges and opportunities offered by new environments, contributed to further divergence among scattered communities. Should the accumulated data support the, quote, short chronology for the settlement of East Polynesia after about 1,000 years ago, end of quote, as illustrated above, then models of population growth and sociopolitical development would indicate rapid evolution in island settings that lacked most old world diseases, together with the required land area and resource space that would have encouraged social complexity in selected contexts. It is assumed that population growth generally follows settlement of a pristine environment, such as island. Through time, the intrinsic growth would level off at or near carrying capacity, that is, the ability of the environment to support a given number of people because of increased mortality as density rises. On small, resource-poor islands, the need to devise strategies for managing population may have arisen quickly so as not to outstrip resources. While warfare, human sacrifice, cannibalism, infanticide, and abortion may have contributed to population regulation, there were also non-destructive means such as moral restraint, ritual celibacy, prolonged lactation, and adoption as an alternative to ensuring continuity of the family line. However, it may be that in some instances, underpopulation was a more serious threat to community survival than population pressure. Initially, at least, relatively large families and clans would be necessary to ensure adequate levels of resource, resource production. Inter-island contacts would confer advantages in the event of demographic instability and shortages in food and raw materials as a result of environmental perturbation, such as that caused by drought or cyclones. Because of their marginality for human existence, low coral islands or atolls occupy a prominent position in discussions centered on exchange. Atolls may be connected to high volcanic islands, but in the absence of the latter, elaborate internal networks were established. These networks functioned to redistribute resources between atolls that differed in terms of productivity, linked to variation in rainfall, island size, as well as a degree of lagoon closure, shape, and depth. Reliable estimates of population throughout the Pacific region at the time of European contact are difficult to come by. This is quite understandable given the short time spent by early explorers. When local populations were finally reported in censuses, nearly a half century had elapsed since the first contact. It was probably during the initial phase of contact that dramatic demographic changes took place. But without good estimates of population just prior to contact, it is nearly impossible to make meaningful statements regarding the extent of the alleged declines. However, pre-contact household and settlement archaeology combined with measures of agricultural production are now offering new insights. There is growing evidence that many islands suffered dramatic declines in their population following initial contact with Europeans. Although demographers, historians, and archaeologists concede that such decline varied in intensity from island to island and from place to place on larger islands. Deferential population density at the time of European contact may have set the stage for the subsequent impact of introduced diseases, with denser settlements suffering the greatest decline because of the higher risk of contagion. While European introduced diseases from the mid-19th to early 20th century contributed to well-documented population declines on several islands, because of the inhabitants' relative epidemiological isolation, depopulation also followed in the wake 
of forced migrations to work on plantations and mines in the region and farther afield. Another important cause of depopulation and displacement was intergroup warfare, encouraged by political, economic, and religious rivalries that accompanied external trade and missionary influence. Throughout the region, mobility patterns have changed significantly in response to colonial pacification and the emergence of monetary economies. At contact, mobility was usually highly localized, particularly in Melanesia. In other areas where cultures were more homogenous over greater distances, mobility was more widespread. For example, the outer atolls or outer islands of Yap in Western Micronesia. The cessation of warfare and the weakening of traditional power structures, together with the establishment of missions, plantations, and growing commercialization of trade goods, resulted in greater mobility. Subsequent mobility was influenced by population growth and the reduction of available land because of the encroachment of Europeans and other settlements. For example, the indentured laborers from India in Fiji or the Okinawan and Filipino plantation workers in Hawaii. Other mobility factors included urbanization and new needs for cash income. Until the second half of the 20th century, international migration from Pacific Islands was rare. It was not until the 1960s that long-distance migration came to characterize the contemporary Pacific. Since then, alongside urbanization, the main direction of migration has been out-migration to the metropolitan states of the Pacific Rim in response to relatively better economic prospects. However, the economic gap remains large, and illegal migration strategies were possible through entry with a short-term visa, settlement, and job finding with the help of relatives in that country, and subsequent application for residency or citizenship status. Migration broadly followed colonial links. New Zealand is a prime destination. The United States is also important, receiving migrants from American Samoa and the former trust territory of the Pacific Island, which comprises much of Micronesia. Another network is between New Caledonia and the other French territories. Higher education opportunities are also attracting younger migrants and relatively impoverished nations like Kiribati and Tuvalu, Tuvalu formerly under British control, have experienced limited out-migration, but have been dependent on temporary labor migration to Nauru until quite recently to work on phosphate mining and employment on shipping lines. International migration is primarily a Polynesia and more recently a Micronesian phenomenon. In parts of Polynesia, more people are resident overseas than in the home islands. Some nations like Niue and the Cook Islands now have declining populations. Larger states such as Tonga and Samoa continue to experience very limited population growth as immigration has become a safety valve for slowly growing economies. Fiji has experienced significant out-migration since 1987 as a result of political instability. Generally increasing migration numbers, greater permanence of migrant overseas, the emergence of second-generation Pacific Islanders overseas and declining populations in some smaller islands have emphasized the shifting balance of island populations towards metropolitan states and the emergence of what has been described as a Pacific diaspora. By contrast, and very differently from the blackbirding era, few Melanesians are now overseas. With growing populations overseas, new webs of relationships have been established, spanning island and metropolitan contexts and even beyond. Island incomes are increasingly derived from overseas as remittances and aid and growing pressures have been placed on metropolitan states to remove obstacles to further migration. As a response to domestic economic stagnation, Island governments have put increasing pressure on the metropolitan countries to enable guest worker migration. The primary motive for migration in the Pacific, as elsewhere, is economic improvement for migrants and their families, although political and environmental changes and cultural considerations also affect flows. Migration decisions are usually shaped within the family context. As migrants leave to meet certain family expectations, the key one of which is usually support for kin. Migrations has rarely been an individual decision to meet individual goals. 
nor has it been dictated by national interest, except perhaps by the atoll nations of Kiribati and Tuvalu. Migration is directed at improving both the living standards of those who remain at home and the lifestyle and income of the migrants. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, identifies the most adverse primary impacts of climate change as rising sea levels, greater frequency of drought and flooding, and increased intensity and frequency of violent storms. The secondary impacts of climate change, specifically general health decline and more vulnerable food and water supplies that influence population movements, may prove to have the most adverse effects on vulnerable populations at risk. Coral reef environments, which exist in many Pacific Island nations, are considered the most vulnerable ecosystems to each degree of change in global temperature. Consequently, rising global temperatures will result in a host of adverse impacts on low-lying small island countries. When combined with socioeconomic factors, these impacts could have an even more negative impact. In some island states, the secondary impacts of rising global temperatures are forcing residents to migrate from more vulnerable outer islands to capital islands, leading to mutually reinforcing economic and environmental declines. The environmentally induced internal migration is contributing to high urban growth rates as it combines with other migratory pull influences and high urban birth rates. Contributing to the crisis, local policy responses of the respective government have been short-term in scope and unsustainable both financially and contextually. Environmental migrants or refugees in an international context are those who, for compelling reasons of sudden or progressive changes in the environment that adversely affects their lives or living conditions, are compelled to leave their homes or choose to do so either temporarily or permanently and who move either within their country or overseas. Developing countries do not have the financial or logistical capacity to cope with rapid climate change and that part of the population which is actively engaged in subsistence-related activities is most vulnerable to climate change. This puts pressure on these populations to use traditional adaptation strategies such as migration. The customary lifestyle of most Pacific Islanders has changed little over the last 2,000 years. Although Pacific Islanders have learned to adapt to their ever-changing environments over the centuries, Recent climatic shifts may exceed their ability to adapt within local resilience capacity. Recent disruptions in weather patterns have made outer island populations in low-lying countries particularly vulnerable, resulting in increased inter-island migration, a traditional adaptation strategy used by their ancestors. For some of the smaller atoll nations, out-migration may mean resettlement in another country with consequent costs both to original and recipient states. Some argue that there may be some benefits to permanent relocation, while others will pay costs. Young unemployed islanders with few educational or economic opportunities at home may benefit from access to educational facilities, the job market, and perhaps the greater freedom available in developed countries provided that industrialized countries identified as probable destinations are prepared to accept such populations. However, older Pacific Islanders and those who unwillingly relocate may be the losers if forced to migrate. Many in this category may experience psychological trauma and perhaps suffer from a sense of cultural loss, and they may have difficulty adapting to modern Western market-based culture. With proper planning and specific policy implementation, the costs of relocation for displaced persons and recipient states can be minimized. So far, policy responses have been designed and implemented at the local level in a reactionary nature. In order for countermeasures to be sustainable, the international community must take responsibility for a macro-level, multidimensional approach. Many islanders now grow up in new contexts with more detached perceptions of what it is being an islander 
and how, what it entails in the reduced likelihood of ever living or visiting there. The lives of such new transnational populations have only a marginal relationship even to that of the grandparents, unconstrained by complex ties to island places, but with new uncertainties about identity and belonging in places where they may have be seen as minorities who belong elsewhere. Interest in migration has long been such that in Samoa, when prospects for immigrations were particularly poor in the early 1980s, the, quote, broken dreams of potential migrants contributed to a significant rise in youth suicide. The economic future of several states partly hinges on the continued flow of remittances and hence on some continuity of migration. While this has become part of a culture of migration where emigration is normal and an important element in household and national and social and economic systems, its future depends on contexts and decisions largely made outside the Pacific Islands. In conclusion, a short-term and short-distance mobility has gradually given way to long-term or permanent migration over vast distances beyond the metropolitan fringes of the Pacific new questions over identity and belonging have been raised. As members of transnational ethnic communities, Pacific Islands have access to considerably more geographically extended resources and opportunities than ever. Yet, even in pre-European contact times, similar patterns of mobility existed. We might say that Pacific Islanders continue to travel beyond the horizon and often display resilience to the shocks of new social and economic environments while striving to maintain ties with those left behind. Additional resources have been included in this presentation, including four YouTube videos. Pacific Guest Workers describes New Zealand's seasonal guest worker program begun in 2007 and targeting five Pacific Island nations to pick fruit in light of local short labor shortage. Guest workers send remittances to their families and villages. This constitutes a form of direct foreign aid. For decades, Australia and New Zealand have poured billions of aid dollars into the troubled Pacific region, often with questionable results. Gangster's Paradise, New Zealand's hip-hop crime wave, is about the drug-fueled gang culture in New Zealand. Unlike the traditional ethnic gangs, these new street gangs model themselves on LA's gangsters and are attracting younger and younger recruits. It is estimated that there are 2,000 young gang members in Auckland. While political debate rages on how to curb gang activity, some youth workers are taking matters into their own hands. They drive around the gang hotspots, trying to befriend the vulnerable youngsters. Paradise Drown, Tuvalu, the disappearing nation, focuses on an atoll nation that is described by many to be among the most seriously threatened by rising sea levels caused by climate change. To go or to stay. Tokelau, still afloat on the high seas, provides a glimpse at the people of Tokelau as they adapt to climate change rather than considering themselves to be victims of an unfolding catastrophe. <laughs>